Uh, this story is another one of those um, that unfortunately, I'm surprised no one has really done a lot with. I am shocked in some ways that this was never like a TV movie of the week or something like that, because it has a lot of pretty sensational characters in it. Um, and especially with all the true crime material that's out there lately, that somebody hasn't covered this on a podcast or you know done a YouTube of it, something. Um, but because there isn't a lot of secondary material out there on this on this particular story, I once again had to kind of piece things together. I myself came across this story just as I was researching another program and there was bits uh, uh, on a column about uh, this particular uh, case involving Maud Coffitz that caught my eye. And I just thought, well, if I can dig up more on her, uh, I, I, let's see about putting something together. And luckily I was. Uh, this case and all of the, the various components of it were very heavily covered by the newspapers of the day. And there are still some court opinions. Um, there are certain aspects of this story that do involve court cases. Um, so some of those verdicts and things still do exist. Uh, so there was some of that primary source material that could be tracked down. Now the story of Maud, I think Maud Coffitz, uh, really unfolds in three parts. So I'm going to try and keep to the chronology of the events as best that I can. But before we do begin, I do want to let everyone know that this story does involve descriptions of domestic violence and suicide. Um, and so if these are topics that may be triggering for some or uh, not suitable for all viewers, you know, please feel free to log off now. Um, and with that, let's dive in. Part one, three shots are fired. So on the morning of December 27th, 1917, police were called to the Coffitt's home at 1637 Gramercy Place in Los Angeles. This is a, a photograph of the home. Now, according to local papers, a dispute between Maud Coffitt's and who was about 41 years old at this time and her well-to-do German-born husband, and this is gonna become very important to the story. Um, his name was William. He was a real estate mogul and he was a bit older than Maud. He was about 65 years old at this time. Uh, an altercation between them, a dispute between them had turned pretty violent. Uh, no one could account for how the altercation began. There was no one, no witnesses to the argument that took place prior. Um, but the fight did move from the house into their yard, into their backyard. And during the course of that movement from the house to the yard, um, Maud had gotten a gun and had fired three shots at William, one of those shots hitting him in the left shoulder. And the pair were discovered actually in the backyard of the residence by Maud's chauffeur, a gentleman by the name of Jacob Mignot. Um, at the time, William was on top of Maud choking her um, when the chauffeur came up upon them and broke up the fight. So what happened between this couple to, to bring them to such a violent state? This is 1917. We don't often think about these stories being reported in local papers. Now, I couldn't find any previous reports, um, legal or in the newspapers, of any conflict between this particular couple, this well-to-do couple. Um, as a matter of fact, about 11 years prior to this event, the marriage of Maud and William, this is a copy of their marriage record from Ohio that you see there, uh, made headlines. Uh, when it was announced, um, it was seen as a really kind of fortunate, albeit surprising match uh, for William, because just the year prior to his marriage to Maud, he had suffered some, some pretty horrific losses in his life. Um, prior to marrying Maud, 
1906, William had been previously married. His wife, Catherine, um, was, uh, they'd been married a, a long time, for about 25 years, and she suddenly passed away in their home on Fedora Street around October 20th, 1904. Um, this is a copy of um, kind of like an obituary written, in, published in the LA Times in 1904. And just to read a quick snippet of it, it says, you know, Mrs. Catherine Coffitz, wife of William Coffitz at number 111 uh, Fedora Street, well-known and prominent residents of Pico Heights, suddenly died from heart failure Thursday morning. Uh, apparently, William didn't return home until about seven in the evening. That's when he finds Maud on the floor. Um, she was apparently a very healthy woman and her death was entirely unexpected. Goes on to tell you a little bit about the family. They had two children together, a son that they refer to in this as Frederick. His legal name was Fritz, um, who was at home and Louis or Ludwig um, who had been visiting family in Germany. Now, the funeral services were held um, at the family's church, the uh, con Congregational Church of Pico Heights, uh, by a Reverend uh, Schaffle, um, who spoke in the highest esteem of this, of Catherine. I've now, got a question from Ruth. Uh, she's looking up the address. Is this North or South Gram Gramercy Place? Uh, south. It was South Gramercy. Um, unfortunately, there's the house no longer stands. Now, after the death of Catherine, the family continues to live on Fedora Street when another tragedy struck a year later. On November 14th, 1905, this was published in the LA Evening Express. Uh, murder, murder's brother kills himself. Probable insanity prompts Fritz Coffitz to commit shocking tragedy. Uh, that's a photo of Fritz that you see there. Um, along with this headline, they also published the note that Fritz left for William. And in it, he goes on to talk about really the depression that he had been feeling since the passing of their mother. Um, and he himself had a lot of medical issues. He was going deaf. Um, he was the older of the two brothers. He was about 29 years old at the time. Ludwig was about 22. And his father, seeing this depression, I guess, tried to take him out of the home for a while. They went on a seven month uh, trip to Germany to visit family. And during that time that they were away, uh, Ludwig was placed, at, uh, was given power of attorney and ran all of his, their father's uh, businesses. And he also made a lot of dramatic changes in the house on Fedora Street. Uh, he brought in renters. He moved the rooms of Fritz and William into much smaller rooms and Ludwig took the larger room to himself. Uh, so there seemed to have been some kind of internal conflicts with the family. And in this note that he leaves for his father, Fritz says, you know, now you'll be able to marry again so that you can have someone that cares for you. You have no need of having children or can if you like. At any rate, I will make a clean sweep to correct the mistake you made when you took a drunkard. So when I read that, I thought, I started thinking a lot about how you don't really know what happens in a marriage. You don't really know what's happening in a family, in the private lives of people. And so much of history is kind of trying to pick, it, pick apart these events to understand really what what is happening? What happened on a particular date with a particular group of people? So after the murder-suicide of his children, um, William understandably begins to isolate himself quite a bit. And for months, um, he remains at the house on Fedora Street where he's lost his entire family. And then all of a sudden around late March, early April, it seems that everything kind of changed. Um, this is uh, an excerpt from the LA Times published in May of 1906. For months after the tragedy, the stricken father denied himself 
to callers and led a lonely life in the big house on Pico Heights. Friends who willingly would have helped him could not approach the sorrowing man because of the intensity of his grief. Fate has followed the elder Coffits and has relentlessly stricken his loved ones until he is the only surviving male member of the house. More than a year ago, his wife fell dead in the kitchen of the house where the double tragedy took place. And then all of a sudden, Coffitz takes leaves Los Angeles to head out east. And he's not really telling his friends where he's going. Um, but soon he the mystery of his travels is resolved when it find when people find out that he actually left for Ohio and was married. Uh, the woman he married was Maud, and people were not expecting this marriage to take place. And in the papers, it's just written that she is somehow a friend of the family, sympathized with him after all of this terrible trouble, and that that sympathy ripened into romance. So for the first several years of their marriage, things seemed relatively happy between Maud and William. Um, these are some of the few clippings I could find about their, their early life together. About two months after their marriage, William and Maude attend a dedication service of a very expensive pipe organ that William donates to the Pico Heights uh, Congregational Church in memory of his wife, Catherine. Um, so that's the article that you see on the left. And then a few months into their marriage, a decision is made that they're going to build a new house. Um, they leave the house on Fedora Street and move into the property on Gramercy um, where the shooting took, took place. Now, the oddest write-up that I came across though was about a year into their marriage on June 27th, 1907. And it regards a Dr. Watson. Freed from the charge of having performed a criminal operation upon Florence Grover, Dr. C.V.P. Watson, notorious because of his connection with several swindling schemes in Los Angeles, was arrested on a mansla manslaughter charge yesterday afternoon as he was leaving the courtroom. His bail was fixed at $10,000 on the new charge. William Coffitz and his wife went on his bond and he was released. Now, I, this struck me as a little odd. I mean, he is a very well-to-do man, um, but it it seemed like an, an odd character for them to be friends with. And a little bit more about their relationship um, doesn't become revealed until a little over a decade later. Now, the only other mention that I could find about their early life together is uh, Maude's sister, Anna, who at one time was offered to William, supposedly, um, by Maude and Anna's father, um, was married at the Coffitt's home in, on Gramercy uh, in 1910, and William actually gave her away. So what changed? in the ensuing years that, that brought this couple to such a violent act? Well, it all depends on who you believe. Um, just a day after the shooting took place, statements are made by both sides uh, to the press as to what happened and the reason behind it. So first we'll start. I have a quick Ooh. question, Jenny. Oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, Ruth wants to know if the criminal operation would be an abortion. Most likely, yes, that's how it was often referred to in the papers. Um, Florence, you know, they don't go into any specifics in the papers, um, but Florence uh, did die several days after being attended by Dr. Watson. Um, so yes, most likely it was an abortion. So according to Maude, um, the whole reason behind this shooting is one of um, increasing tension inside the Coffitt's household at this time. Um, it's 1917 and Maude claims that she shot William because he was, she was frightened of him. He had attacked her um, and had pulled a gun on her 
And he was enraged because she had purchased some Liberty bonds in support of the United States during World War I. Remember the shooting happens in uh, just after Christmas, uh, December 27th. And so the United States has only been involved in the Great War since April. Um, so she claims that her husband, who was born in Germany, um, immigrated to the U.S. as a teenager, is a German sympathizer, um, that he, there's pictures of the Kaiser in their house, um, that he only reads German newspapers, and that he's becoming, you know, increasingly agitated. His demeanor and his behavior is, is cha was changing quite a bit, and he was furious with her for, you know, talking about wanting to become a Red Cross nurse or, you know, donating money to purchase Liberty bonds. Now, this is a pretty big accusation. Um, in great, during the Great War, when the United States becomes involved, uh, feelings towards German communities, um, people are becoming very xenophobic. Um, this is a common charge that unfortunately we don't we don't talk about i think enough of the long history that the united states has had in regards to referring to community groups as alien enemies and this is kind of a forgotten part of the us's history during the great war so what an alien enemy is is really throughout its history the american government has determined various immigrant groups to be a threat to national security so when the u.s entered the war on april 6 1917 german citizens residing in the united states uh, went from immigrants to alien enemies pretty much overnight uh, restrictions were placed on where they could live um, what they could do for work how and when they traveled and um, what they could even own. So during the 19 months that the US was involved in the war, um, as these feelings of you know, German, xenopho German xenophobia are, are kind of ramping up, um, nearly a half a million German alien enemies are registered. Many of these are put under surveillance and the often forgotten part about this is also that thousands were sent to internment camps in the United States. Um, their private property and assets were then uh, confiscated by the American government, um, which totaled at that time close to half a billion dollars. So the images that you're seeing on your screen right now are actually an arrest record that we have in the museum uh, collection for a gentleman by the name of Anton Berschneider, who I'm going to highlight right there, was arrested as an alien enemy in Los Angeles about six weeks prior to the shooting of um, William by Maud. Now, the reason I'm sharing this is his story is one that I think is a common story a common story of people living in the United States from Germany at this time. Um, Anton had immigrated to the United States in 1911, so several years before the war breaks out. Um, he sails on a, as a third class passenger on a ship called the Patricia. He's 26 years old when he sails. He is a butcher by trade. Um, in, by 1916, he's made his way to Los Angeles and on February 8th, 1917, he first files his declaration of intention, um, basically taking his first steps to becoming a naturalized American citizen in which he has to renounce his allegiance to Germany, but his application becomes suspended um, because the United States enters war <laughs> and goes into, you know, and declares war on Germany. Um, then on November 5th, 1917, Anton is arrested. Now that's where the booking card comes from. And I was unable to determine what the grounds were, like what law he had broken. You know, I couldn't even find if he would ever was given any kind of trial, like what brought him to suddenly being declared an alien enemy. Um, but nine days later, on November 14th, 
um, he, this is published in the Los Angeles Herald. Um, they just publish this very brief article, this snippet that basically says he was arrested for alleged unfriendly attitudes towards the government. That's about as far as it goes. And then he was then sent to Fort Douglas, Utah, where he spends the remainder of the war and all of his private property, property, which at that time only totaled to about $430, was turned over to the US government. So you could see why um, being suspected of being an alien enemy is a really terrifying prospect for people uh, living in the United States at the time. And so while he's cover recovering in the hospital from the gunshot wound, William is very quick to get his version of events out there and releases a statement to the press. Um, so William's story is, is very different from Maud's. You know, he says that um, when the chauffeur, Jacob, uh, discovered the two of them, he, he doesn't deny that he was in the process of choking um, Maud at that time. You know, he says that, you know, I quarreled with her, the story that she gives that I quarreled with her about Liberty bonds is all false. I didn't even know that she had bonds. Had I known of it, I would have been glad of it. Um, she also claims that, you know, he had the pistol, which he says, you know, I've never owned a gun in my life. So I don't even know where that gun came from. And if, and even if I did have one, I don't even know how to use one. Um, he then goes on to relate the story that uh, he found out in June that she was seeing another man and that he confronted her about it. She denied it. And then he went away from the house for several weeks in July. And that's when she went to the beach in Venice and took up with this guy again. I know he visited her there. And so um, at that point, I decided I was going to call off the marriage. And um, so it has nothing to do with Liberty Bonds. I'm a good patriotic citizen. And it's really just a, a private matter of her having an affair. And so therefore, um, the, all this nonsense should, should be kind of dropped. He even has his attorney, J.L. Murphy, release a statement regarding the paintings of the Kaiser in his house, which he did have. Um, and he says, you know, it was, it was a gift from his niece that lived in Germany five years ago, so long before the war even started. And that the fact that he's being painted guilty of the highest crime against the government, a crime punishable by death, um, you know, these stories need to be corrected. So I'm going to ask you, who do you believe? So ISIS is going to put up a poll for you guys. Um, is it Maud's story that, you know, her pro-German husband was irate that, you know, $25,000 is purchased in Liberty bonds. Um, and so he was very angry with her and attacked her because of that. Or do you think it's William's story that the two had a happy marriage until she supposedly takes up with another man? Or I'm going to give you guys a third option of whether or not um, you're undecided, you know, that you want a little bit more information before making a decision. So while you guys do that, I'm going to take a sip of water here. I'm going to give it 30 more seconds. Okay. Okay, this is this is interesting. Most most people are reserving judgment. That's okay. That's good. A couple of people are, are leaning more towards William. Oh, some people have changed someone changed their mind. Their mind. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. All right. Last chance, and I'm gonna end the poll. All right. Okay, you know, that's that's very interesting. You guys are are leaning, uh, most people are, are reserving judgment. Um, but a few of you are leaning more towards the story of most likely Maude is trying to murder him because of, of an affair, possibly. And then I have a question from Alan. He wants mm -hmm. to know, what is the president's warrant? Could you say that again? What is the president's warrant? Warrant. That's what it says here. Uh, maybe Alan could provide a few more details to the context of his question.
Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean by that exactly, the president's warrant. I will update you when, if Alan updates me. Okay. Sorry about that, Alan. I, maybe it's, it's in regards to the Alien Enemies um, Act. So, um, Oh, here it is. He says it was a few slides back as a reason for the arrest. Oh, um, no, that, uh, oh, for, for Anton, for Anton, uh, let me go back real quick. Um, so on Anton's charge, um, it, it, a presence war warrant ordering internment until the end of the war. So that just gave the president the ability to basically sus suspend habeas corpus. Uh, so that way these people could be taken without a trial and brought into these internment camps um, until the end of the war because they were suspected of doing something so they didn't necessarily have a right to trial. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, so like most of you, the police weren't really sure what to do with these two stories of William and Maud's either. Um, they never arrested Maud for the shooting, which everybody agrees she had done. Um, there wasn't, <laughs> weirdly, um, there was no laws on the books about abusing your wife. Um, so that wasn't really a criminal act. It was, it was communally looked down upon. You have the assault possibilities because he was seen by an eyewitness choking her. Um, however, no eyewitness saw the shot or saw how the argument began. So it is a very much a he said, she said story. Um, William also does not have charges brought against her uh, for the shooting. Um, he, William is looked into um, for a brief period of time by local police for his suspected pro-German activity, but nothing really comes of it. Then um, by January, 1918, um, it's decided that they're going to file, uh, William defiles for divorce. Um, so literally one month, pretty much to the day after the shooting, it's reported in the LA Evening Express that uh, William is looking to part ways. And during the divorce hearing, both sides really continue to hold fast to their arguments um, that the whole conflict is because of William's pro-German tendencies um, and that William is saying, you know, she is too flirtatious with other men. You know, I believe she might be having an affair of some sort. And so um, a determination is finally made come May 18th of uh, 1918. Uh, Judge Jackson uh, granted an, what they call an interlocutionary decree um, of divorce in favor of William, but not on the grounds of any kind of affair, alienation of affection, anything like that. Um, he actually didn't really allow much testimony in, in that regards, basically based on the facts that was jointly agreed upon and known, the fact that Maud shot <laughs> William, um, he permitted the divorce on the grounds of extreme cruelty. I've got um, a question from Sunny. Uh, did we have internment camps in California for German Americans? Uh, no, we did not. Um, let's see, Anton is sent to Utah. Most of them are also um, in more rural areas uh, out in the Midwest and things as well. Uh, interesting, uh, interestingly enough, also during the war and, and previous, if a woman married a German citizen, uh, she would lose her American citizenship at that time as well. So, All right. And then Alan asks, did they find the Liberty Bond, the torn up one or the purchase itself? Um, they There's no reference um, to whether or not she 
actually purchased these Liberty bonds. Um, I assume because nobody ever claimed that that was a fraudulent purchase. Um, because even William in one of the articles says, you know, like, I'm had I known she had bought them, I would have been happy. It, like, there's no disputing whether or not she actually purchased Liberty bonds. Um, so after the divorce decree comes down, um, they're, they're parting ways. Uh, she moves into the home of her sister, Anna, and, you know, they're, they're kind of dividing things up. And then on November 22nd, 1908, um, William suddenly passed away. Again, he was, he was much older than his wife. This is a copy of his death certificate. You can zoom in a little bit so you can see that a little bit better. Um, so he has basically heart disease. Um, so either he had a stroke or a heart attack. Uh, the newspaper accounts are that, you know, he was working in the yard of a property that he had owned when he suddenly just passed away. Uh, there was an autopsy, there was an investigation. I'm sure people were very curious as to, you know, why he suddenly passed, but it didn't seem like there was any kind of foul play. He was 67 years old at the time that he had passed away as well. So about eight days after William's death, literally the day after the funeral is held, Maud files a petition with the probate courts that says, well, William didn't have a, a will. And uh, because the divorce wasn't finalized, because after that interlocutionary uh, decree, uh, you have one year before the divorce is finalized. Um, so technically they're still married. And so she is legally his widow instead of his ex-wife, his, his divorce wife. And so she asks, that um, while this, you know, has to go through probate, that this gentleman, his name was Charles H. McGuire, is made a special administrator of the estate. Now, McGuire was employed by the city of Los Angeles as a engineer, assistant engineer um, for the Board of Public Utilities. He just happened to have met Maude a few years, or excuse me, a few months uh, before William's death. And they seem to be on friendly terms is how it's, it's kind of talked about. Um, he is married, he has children of his own. Um, when he is named special administrator, uh, he separates from his wife and starts living in the Trinity Hotel for a period of time. Um, this, arrangement does not sit well with William's niece and nephew, uh, Lizzie Minot and uh, his nephew, uh, Willie Coffitz. Um, they quickly file for the removal of McGuire, uh, saying that actually, uh, hold up, a will has been created. And it was, um, and we have it here, and they quickly filed it with the probate court. And the new will had been uh, created just prior to the divorce, divorce proceedings beginning. And it explicitly left Maude out of the estate um, that actually William specifically gave his reasons why he was leaving Maude out uh, when he created the will. So this is um, a little snippet about the, the claims that um, there was no will created or that one couldn't be found. Um, so they really accuse Charles uh, McGuire and Maude of posing these fraudulent claims to the court and that on those grounds alone, he should be removed, um, that they were aware that there was a will and that she was even in the presence of witnesses um, stated that she intended to get all of the money that she could out of the estate. Again, this is another kind of he said, she said, um, but when they do submit the will to the probate court, um, it is stated in there 
why he did not intend to to give her any to give her any part of his estate. Um, he says that you know the failure to provide for her is out um, is because she refused to bear him a child, and further because she actually had sufficient money of her own. Um, her father had left her a, a sizable sum, um, so she wasn't really in need of his money. And so he wants to give his money and a share of his estate. He wants to divide it up between five individuals. He has a brother and a niece still living in Germany uh, that he wants to leave $10,000 each to. His estate was valued at around $75,000. Um, he wanted to give $500 uh, to the Reverend, Reverend Shafley um, from the Pico Congregational Church and the remainder of the estate was to be divided between his niece and nephew living in Los Angeles. So these accusations of fraud um, by William's niece and nephew, as well as kind of continually growing statements by Maud that not only was her husband an alien enemy, but his relatives are as well. Um, and she even takes things one step further and accuses her husband of being of unsound mind when the will was created. Um, she even goes into this very lengthy um, letter that she sends to the uh, LA Evening Express that's published on December 9th, 1918. And it says, you know, my reasons for this matter are both personal and patriotic. I am personally concerned in vindicating my rights as the widow of Mr. Coffitz to do my share of his estate. I am opposing the attempt of my husband's nephew and niece to gain control of the administration because they are German subjects, the nephew being an ex-Prussian officer and the niece born in Germany. And she then goes on to say, you know, I regard them as alien, uh, resident alien enemies and entitled to no consideration as I am a patriotic American woman. Um, she goes on to say how her brother's in the army, how uh, McGuire's son is serving in the Navy, um, that, you know, she wanted to work for the Red Cross. She was buying Liberty bonds and donating funds and that her husband was really just mentally unbalanced. And that, you know, even his German relatives should should see that and that she's actually being very charitably inclined, basically because she's not having them arrested is how I read that. Um, you know, she then goes on to speak highly of McGuire, you know, he's a patriotic American citizen, um, you know, the reason why she hired the attorney that she did Joseph Scott, you know, because he was not afraid to fight for a, a reputable cause. He has a good reputation of courage and honor. Um, so she just goes on and on, basically touting all of this patriotic messaging about why she deserves it more than his family does. Um, and that, you know, American made money should stay in America and not be given, you know, overseas, you know, um, to these questionable people. Um, so a very long court case uh, does ensue uh, around the will of William Coffitz. Um, and the attorneys that his niece and nephew hire, one in particular, the gentleman you see on your screen, Oscar Lawler, um, was a a bulldog. He had a very high reputation amongst LA attorneys at the time. He was a very prominent attorney in LA. And he had also done a stint as an assistant US Attorney General under President Taft. In 1911, he was hired by then LA District Attorney John D. Fredericks to oversee the gathering of evidence in the dynamiting of the LA Times building by the McNamara brothers. Um, he prosecuted more than 30 members of the International Bridge and Structural Iron Workers Association for conspiring to traffic explosives. So he has a lot of familiarity with these very public, high profile cases. Um, I think a will case is kind of an odd case for him to take. 
but I digress. Um, he he was a heavy hitter, so maybe they were just looking for the best possible attorney for them. And so he quickly files affidavits saying that not only, not only is McGuire committing fraud because he already knew that a will existed at the time that he was named special administrator, um, but that he was also threatening witnesses. In uh, these two articles here, um, he states that McGuire um, is violently, energetically, and vigorously partisan and is otherwise incompetent to act. He also then, um, in another affidavit, talks about McGuire, um, that he had threatened a, a doctor that was going to testify on behalf of the um, niece and nephew that he had threatened another guy um, by the name of Irvin Bingle, who had information linking Maud with a gentleman by the name of Carl uh, Fritz Beryl, um, that he was kind of running around town threatening every possible witness that might be called for this case. Um, so, The, even though they file these affidavits, McGuire still isn't removed as special administrator. And so it goes to trial um, and a jury is put together and other information is then brought out by Lawler. Alan uh, has a question. He says the previous amount of state was 40K. Now it states it's 75K. Yeah, uh, the, the, because the initial amount after his death was um, basically misquoted. So later on that it's realized that the fight for the estate is actually more like $75,000 because of all the various real estate properties he had. So when the trial begins, all this other information, they go after Maude very, very hard. Things that weren't even brought out in the divorce proceedings are brought out during this probate trial um, because they really want to paint Maud as being, you know, unfit in a lot of ways. Um, when really all they have to prove is that William was of sound mind when he created his will, but instead they kind of attack Maud's reputation instead. And Reverend Chaffley. Um, it testifies regarding the marriage of William and Maude. And he says some pretty damning things. Um, he testifies, and again, this is in public record that he told his wife, um, he told him that his wife was in the hospital about, this is about a year after their marriage and that she was under the care of a Dr. Wellburn. And I asked him the cause of her illness. And he told me that she had seen a Dr. Watson a physician on Pico Heights, and that an operation had been committed or an attempt was made. Because of that, she became very ill under Dr. Watson's treatment and immediately went to the hospital under the care of Dr. Wellburn. Um, then he says that Mr. Coffitz regretted this very much, and he told him, he told Reverend Chaffley of his desire to have a family. He was getting along in years and he wanted children. Um, again, they're not saying point blank she had an abortion. Um, her family, as well as her, would later testify that she had actually been in a railroad accident several years before an emergency operation had to be done. Um, she was unable to have children. Um, it's questionable also that, you know, this is the same Watson that they provided bail money to at about the same time that this supposed operation had also taken place on Maud. Um, then they ask him later, <laughs> which is very strange, uh, to kind of clarify who Dr. Watson is and whether or not it is the same Dr. Watson who was eventually um, arrested and sent to jail uh, for performing abortions in, in Los Angeles. Uh, which he, of course, testifies that, yes, it was one and the same uh, persons. Now, they also bring in Maude's private maid, uh, a Mrs. Helen McGuire, and she testifies that 
you know, Maud had a penchant for flirtation, that um, she was friendly with different gentlemen. Nobody testifies to actually seeing any wrongdoing by Maud, but that, yeah, she took car rides with men, um, that there was a specific letter that was entered, um, that was known during the divorce proceedings, um, that was kind of the grounds that William had, that she had received a letter at their home um, signed Geo George, and that it started Dearest Maudie, and it had a hug and a kiss at the end. And this, in William's mind, was enough to prove that his wife was having an affair. Um, which she did deny, but he he still believed that this was this was the evidence that she was having an affair. And so um, they enter this and and they kind of allude to the possibility that it wasn't just this George that she was having an affair with, but there were also other men, this Fritz Barrel um, and one other man, and I'll, his last name is Al. I'll turn, I think it was, um, gets named. Those men aren't called on to testify, um, but just the, the reports of the maid, really. So with all of this information, after several weeks of testimony, this jury of 10 women and two men do return a verdict, um, basically in favor of William's niece and nephew. Um, and they stick more, more or less to the idea that there is no evidence provided that William was of unsound mind. Even if he was a German sympathizer, he'd been investigated. Nobody really knew of anything. He might have been angry about the war, but that doesn't necessarily make him of unsound mind when he creates his will. So it seems that this would kind of be the end of the story, but in some ways, it's only the beginning. In the early morning hours of July 2nd, 1919, a blaze is started in the Pico Heights Congregational Church. After the fire was put out, it seemed that there were actually multiple points of origin. Um, that fires were set throughout the building. There were piles of oil-soaked rags that were placed um, towards the back of the church. Um, the back door of the church was unlocked. It was found open. Um, there was also two points of ignition under the pipe organ that had been donated by William way back in 1906. Uh, witnesses that, that because this church was located um, in an area that was surrounded by residential homes, um, they reported seeing two men um, park a car near the back entrance and bring some objects inside and then quickly left. And that the building had this, you know, soon there was the smell of smoke in the air and flames. Um, at first, the police didn't really have any tangible leads other than it seemed that somebody had a grudge against the church. And they had talked to Reverend Shaffley uh, to see if he knew of anybody who had it out for the church. And he said, no one really came to mind, but then he thought of someone a little bit later. Now, approximately a month after this fire in the early morning hours of August 3rd, a loud explosion erupts the darkness at 646 South New Hampshire Street in what's now known as the Wilshire District. And those sounds are followed by the sounds of a second explosion. The home of attorney Oscar Lawler was soon engulfed in flames. Now Lawler and his wife Hilda, you can zoom in here, you can see in this drawing, they were sleeping, let me get the, uh, no, not the highlighter, the laser pointer. Um, they are sleeping in this room, this set of rooms here above the second floor. And the bombs 
were placed just under the porch here. Now they had a five-year-old son who was uh, with his nursemaid sleeping on this sleeping porch on the other side. And witnesses um, say that they saw both Oscar and his wife trying to reach the sleeping porch as flames are engulfing this portion of the house. Um, eventually Hilda is overcome uh, by smoke and Oscar takes her to this window here and tries to kind of drop her to the ground. She kind of hits off this awning and neighbors are able to remove her from the scene. And then he returned again, trying to reach his son and the nursemaid and is very, very badly burned in the process. Um, when he sees that he just can't reach them, he also jumps from that window and they are both taken to a neighbor's home across the street. Um, the neighbors fortunately were very quick to act. Um, they actually found a ladder uh, that could reach the second floor here um, and were able to get their, um, the Lawler child as well as the nursemaid out of the house. Uh, so fortunately no one died due to this incident. Um, but there was a lot of questions as in regards to who would have committed a crime like this. And Oscar, remember, he had tried a lot of prominent bombers over the years. Um, during this time also, um, there is a lot of labor unrest. And not only was the LA Times bombed, but the LA Aqueduct, there was, there was bombings happening across the United States in various locations. Um, under the banner of the IWW and other labor organizations. And so people thought perhaps initially this was tied to the work that he had been doing previously. Um, but witnesses did attest to a very strange car being seen in the area prior, just prior to the, the bombs exploding. Um, this particular car was a very unusual make and model for 1919. It was the Patterson Greenfield automobile. Now, this particular car was built in Greenfield, Ohio by the C.R. Patterson and Sons Automotive Company. It was actually the first African-American car company in the United States, and they began building carriages. But in 1915, they built their first horseless carriage, their first car. And they only build these cars for a few years between 1915 and 1918. And they only built, it's believed to be less than 150 cars before they switched to buses and truck manufacturing. Now in a search, the police automatically, you know, they hear about this car. So they do a vehicle record search and find that there's only one Patterson automobile registered in the entire city and it is owned by the Sitwell Car and Supply Company, kind of like an early car rental place. And so the police go and check the arrest records, or excuse me, <laughs> not there yet, the rental records. And they discover that it had been rented by none other than, who do you think, who do you think? Because I know you guys are, are coming up with ideas. Charles McGuire. The following day, when news of the Waller bombing is printed in local papers, Chief of Police Home um, receives a very interesting phone call from Maud Coffitz. Maud explains to the police that her relationship, so she kind of goes through her whole relationship with McGuire, that the two had met in November of 1919, just prior to the death of her husband, that he was very helpful in um, helping her kind of navigate things after William's death and offered to assist her. He was the one that actually said, well, legally, you are still his wife, so you are then, um, by law, should be allowed a portion of the estate. Um, but she did also say that he could be rather volatile, uh, relating a particular story that 
The man's actions in the past few weeks, now this is just prior to the Lawler bombing, uh, were not those of a sane man. One night, while my sister was away, I was putting a record on the Victrola. He placed a gun against his head and threatened to kill me if I approached him. I su succeeded in calming him down. Other actions of his were such to suggest that he was brooding. He was not interested in the will contest case as much as in losing his position. Just as the will case is coming to an end, um, Mayor Snyder has determined that his position with the public utilities um, is frivolous. And there is a pretty scathing article written in the LA Register that talks about like, McGuire is not even able to administer an estate. You know, why should he be, you know, part of the Public Utilities Commission? And so the council actually votes to get rid of his position. So he's he's very angry at this time. Um, he was a strange man, fond of music and poetry, but I always feared him, especially toward the end. So she then goes on to tell the police. Um, that, by the way, she had recently gone riding with McGuire in a very strange automobile. It happened to be this, this Patterson automobile, maybe you've heard of it, um, that he had taken her to a very remote area in Beverly Hills uh, just a few months before, um, and that he happened to be practicing blowing up bombs. Um, she thought maybe it had something to do with his work. She didn't really know, um, but he seemed awfully angry about Oscar Lawler and had been kind of swearing revenge here and there, just, just to let them know. Um, but she, she was also very fearful about uh, coming forward because at various times he threatened to kill her. So she even offered to show the police um, these locations of where he had practiced you know, his bomb experiments. And when the police and Maude arrived at one of the bomb sites that he was practicing at, police discovered unusual tire impressions, um, which matched the Patterson automobile, and also fragments of pipe bomb uh, explosions that were similar to those that were found at the Lawler house. Um, also, they noticed that there was a strange weed that grew only in that area. And so, they decided, you know, since Charles McGuire was the only person on recent record to have rented this car, um, they brought him in for questioning. Um, but they were delicate, as it says in the newspaper here, um, about how much information they were learning about um, the activities of McGuire prior to the Lawler bombing. Uh, so they state that, you know, they eventually take him um, from this hotel where they're questioning him to then the district attorney's office, attorney Woolwine, um, at the Hall of Records building on the 11th floor, and they start to press him even more. Uh, during their questioning of him, they also bring in different men that Maude had told them about um, where he had gone to purchase pieces to, to build the bombs. And these men were kind of coming in and out of the room and they would nod their heads and later tell the district attorney, you know, yes, this, this is the man who purchased this piece of, you know, metal or, or this particular powder and all of these different things. And so, by about midnight on April 6th, Woolwine and his deputy district attorney, William Doran, um, tell McGuire that, okay, we're going to indict you tomorrow for the bombing of the Lawler house. And then they left the office. Um, McGuire then crosses the room uh, under the pretense that he's going to get a drink of water. And he notices that, you know, a window by the drinking by the water fountain or the water cooler is open and he makes a dive out the window. Uh, he is caught by one leg um, by a police officer who is sitting in the room with him. Um, the men struggle. He kicks a few times. Uh, the gentleman 
um, who caught his leg, I believe his name is Smith, um, hits his head on the radiator. He lost, he loses his grip and McGuire falls 11 stories uh, to the street below. And that pretty much effectively draws uh, a close to the case. Um, the district attorney and the police were very much under the belief that it was McGuire and McGuire alone that planned this particular bombing. Um, and then connections started to be made between the church arson fire and the bombing, um, similarities and witness descriptions of cars and things like that. So then they started to connect the two and believe that McGuire was responsible for both. Um, but there were still a few questions about how much Maud knew prior to the church fire and, and the bombing. Um, and she begins to paint a very different picture to the press the day after his suicide. She states that uh, McGuire came to her house at around seven o'clock at night, uh, the night of the bombing, and forced her to take a ride with him to a secluded area in Beverly Hills. Um, this is a picture, um, the LA Times had her reenact her struggle um, with McGuire uh, on the night of the bombing. Um, she then also talks about how he had threatened to kill her during that time. Let me zoom in here. You know, he threatens, if you try to get out, I'll kill you. Um, McGuire drove up to the place that he had planted the first bomb and he began digging around, uh, looking to find those casings, um, any remains of the explosions. And then um, he took her to another location where he did some target shooting. He had a rifle in the back of the car. Um, and that when he eventually did take her back to the house, she says that I asked him why he took me out on this trip. And he said he intended to kill me, but was afraid he couldn't make a clean job of it. I took you out with full intention of killing you for you know too much, she said to me, is what she tells police. And that uh, he returns her back to her sister's home between 1220 or 1230 and 1245 at night and the bombing happens just a few hours later. She also uh, tells the police again after the fact after he has committed suicide that um, the last time she saw McGuire that uh, he had shown up to her house at eight o'clock around 830 in the morning. Um, after the bombing and that, you know, he just looked awful. He begged her to let him inside. Um, she refused and that, you know, he came to ask about some shells um, that he had fired off the night before saying that he could only find six of them. And if she knew where any additional ones, the additional one was. Um, and then it, she didn't know about the bombing until she read about it in the paper the next day. And you know, she didn't at first think he was involved. She thought and thought about it. And then she realized that, you know, she needed to go to the police. And that's why she told, uh, she contacted the police and, and let them know everything that she knew about the case. Um, so all seems well and good for Maud. It, it looks like the case is resolved. Um, the district attorney is happy. The police are happy. They, they believe that they got their man. Um, but the sheriff's department has a slightly different view of things. Um, they find out on August 12th um, that Maud might have left out a bit of important facts to her story about the time that she spent with McGuire. Turns out that McGuire had rented a cottage on Serrano Street. Um, to, to make the bombs that were used uh, in the Lawler home bombing. And the neighbors there, um, after hearing about this entire case, reading about everything in the newspapers, uh, notified the sheriffs that um, they had seen the woman that they see in the paper, Maude, that they had seen her several times with McGuire on, at the Serrano Street Cottage. And so 
the sheriffs then want Mahad arrested because they believe that she knows more about events than she is telling. Um, Maud very willingly ends up meeting with the police, is interviewed for several hours with the sheriffs as well as the police and the uh, district attorney. Um, she says that, you know, I was just there to kind of do dishes and help with the house. I, I had no idea what he was doing there. I had no idea that, you know, he was building bombs and that he was intending to um, do these nefarious acts. Uh, it's then determined a few days later on August 15th that the grand jury was going to be called, that they were going to hear all the evidence um, just to see if um, Maud should be arrested for her involvement with the case. So over the next several weeks from August 18th until September 16th, they're meeting, they're listening to various witness testimony. Uh, Maud is, you know, speaking with them. Oscar Lawler is finally getting released from the hospital. He's telling him, uh, telling the grand jury about, you know, what his knowledge are, his knowledge is in regards to the events that occurred. And then they finally decide something that you might find pretty shocking. Because the big question is, did McGuire act alone? They decide that, yes, he is the sole person responsible um, for the bombings, that really there isn't enough evidence to indict anyone else. Um, do you guys agree with this? You can just kind of type yes or no in either the Q&A box or the chat box. Um, see if you, if you agree with their decision that McGuire was the only person responsible. <laughs> Get a big no from Alan, I see that. <laughs> Well, this is where we get to an interesting thing in, in legal cases. Myron says no. Because really it does come down, it does come down to evidence. Is there enough evidence to prove Maud had planned any of this? McGuire's gone. He can't say where she was no one else again like that shooting that took place in the altercation and what brought William and Maude um, to that violent act we have no idea there isn't it is a he said she said and if there aren't any other witnesses even the people in the, in the neighborhood who testified to seeing Maud with him at the house nobody can testify that she was building a bomb no one could testify that they were planning this, these nefarious acts these nefarious deeds so they're exactly right terry there just doesn't seem to be enough evidence even if we feel it might be one way or the other um there is really nothing that can you can conclusively say brought Maud to that act. Whereas with McGuire, he was the one that was identified for buying the materials needed. Um, he was the one that rented the car that was seen. Um, so there was much more direct evidence regarding his involvement in this particular set of circumstances versus what Maud may have or may not have participated in. So again, you really never know what is truly going on. Um, so that basically takes us to the end of this particular story. Um, just as a little follow up, Maud did have a tangle uh, again with Oscar Lawler uh, a couple of times after all of this is said and done. Um, William's niece and nephew uh, sue Maud at, at another time for the mishandling of the estate by McGuire. 
since she was the one that had him appointed as a special administrator, uh, there was a question of $2,000 that had been spent by him out of the estate in regards to uh, what he collected as fees for handling the estate. Um, and then the following year, it finally gets kind of resolved and actually no wrongdoing is, is found on the part of McGuire for that, that the fees were determined as reasonable fees. Um, and then about a year after all of this, um, oops, <laughs> Maud, uh, Maud is named as like the other woman in a, a divorce suit brought by um, a woman by the name of Marie Byrell, um, who Carl Fritz Byrell was mentioned in the probate case a couple of years before as being one of the possible um, paramours of Maud. Um, so she's accused of alien of affection, alienation of affection. Oscar Lawler is Marie Byrell's attorney. Um, you know, they claim that, you know, there was an affair that the two of them had back in 1918. It seems that Maude really couldn't be bothered with this case. Uh, she states to the press, you know, I have little interest in the troubles of Fritz and his wife and will be away when the case comes to trial. Later on, maybe I'll return because I like the climate here and it's a nice place to live. And it does seem that Maude does eventually come back to Los Angeles um, because she did die here. Um, this is a copy of her death certificate from November. Uh, she died on November 5th, 1948. Um, she is, has the last name of Crystal by this time. Um, I was not able to find any marriage record for her as, as being married again. Perhaps she just utilized a different last name um, to make it a little easier on her uh, since she was a very infamous woman in Los Angeles for a, a long period of time. But all the other information matched up in regards to family names and um, the person who attests to her information is a nephew. Her One of her sisters had uh, married into um, the, the Butte family, um, which is the name of um, the nephew that finds her or that attests to her death certificate information. Um, so with that, that actually takes me to the end of the story, but I do hope that you'll join us for other future events and stories. Here's a list of just some of the upcoming things that we have going on. Um, in June, our book club, our nonfiction book club is back. They are reading about uh, California history for this next group of readings that they're doing, and they're kicking it off with the great car craze, how Southern California collided uh, with the automobile in the 1920s by Ashley Brilliant. Um, on June 12th, Sunday, June 12th, I will be back um, talking about another very interesting case. Um, this is in regards to the Long Beach purity raids of 1914 and the effects it had on uh, communities here in the Long Beach as well as Los Angeles area and how one man's fight um, against the, the legal system at that time actually led to some laws being changed in California soon after. On June 25th, we're getting back together again uh, in person for our genealogy workshop. It's all relative. So if you're interested in researching some of your family history, you can take part in that workshop. Um, in July, our nonfiction book club is meeting again. This time they're reading Flood Path, which is a really great also documentary on PBS right now about William Mulholland and the building of the LA Aqueduct. Um, and the deadliest man-made disaster of 20th century America and the making of modern Los Angeles. Um, on July 16th, we are doing a screening of a film that was actually filmed at the Homestead Museum in 1936, a B-Western, a very B-Western called Song of the Gringo. And after the screening, uh, you'll be able to explore the site and see the, some of the locations that were used in the film. And then finally, on July 30th and 31st, uh, we have our Monument Memorial Showpiece or Home, uh, a special tour uh, of our 1920s house, the Casa Nueva, um, at its anniversary of turning 100 years old. So we're going to take a, a slightly different look at that house and 
ask, um, have a little discussion about how and why it was built the way it was. As always, you can follow us on um, so our social media accounts, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Homestead Museum, or look for any updates. Also, all the links are uh, live now. If you want to register for any of these programs, uh, you can just go to homesteadmuseum.org and see those there. Just a heads up, Jenny, our website was uh, kind of down earlier and still is a little bit. Some of the links aren't working right now. It should um, sort itself out. It's just a web hosting problem. So gotcha. if you go right now to try to click these links, they're probably not working, uh, but they, but they will be soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Isis. Um, hopefully, also we'll, um, we'll, this will also all be in the emails, uh, the Zoom emails that you'll receive, along with the links to this program and the evaluation. So you can also sign up then. Are there any other final questions, comments? Yeah, thoughts? we have a question from Joyce. She wants to know how old was she when she died. Uh, Maud was in her 70s when she passed away, so she, she lived a, a decently long life. <laughs> uh, Alan wants to point out our clock is off by an hour. It is. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> we know. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> uh, Sunny says, thank you for the interesting presentation. Ruth says, another groovy presentation. Thank you. And Thanks so much. That's all I have right now. I'll give it a little bit for any final comments or questions if anyone has any. Yeah, it's just such a, a strange, strange story that, I mean, poor William, the amount of difficulties that that guy suffered throughout the course of his life. Oh, and I just had a comment come from Myron that's older than the others. Uh, where is William buried? Uh, he is in, I believe it's Rosedale Cemetery. Oh, I'll have to look real quick. I think it's Rosedale. And then Joyce says, thank you. The story had a lot of twists and turns. And Terry says, very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, he and his family, uh, he was buried with his wife, Catherine, and their two sons at Angelus Rosedale Cemetery in LA. Um, so there's a large uh, monument there uh, to the family. All right, that appears to be all the comments. Oh, Eileen also says, thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks so much for, you know, following along on these, these stories. Um, they're a lot of fun to do and it kind of helps to think about events in different ways because we often don't think about how larger national events can impact individual people. So things like the alien enemy, um, acts that were going on at the time, um, you know, how we, believe one side versus the other, because quite honestly, when I was going through this case, I started thinking a lot about the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trials. And it's it's so difficult to kind of know sometimes like who who's really responsible um, for various things that go on inside a marriage. Um, it's it's challenging. It's it's always a challenge to kind of know what really happened. With that, thanks so much, guys, and hopefully we'll see you again next time. And have a lovely day.